we're in a series called Kids Without Lids. It's about unlocking the potential that lies inside of every single child. And we're gonna be a, a, a generational church. I don't know what church you came from or what church you grew up in, but this will be a, a generational church. A beautiful thing happened today. Uh, we have my wife's grandmother visiting. Christine, would you welcome Christine today to North Carolina? So, so grateful that, you know, she took First Lady to church when she was a, a little girl and, and got her to church because it's important that you get your kids to church when they're young. And guess what I did today? I brought grandma to church today. Oh, how the turns have tabled. Oh, how the turntables have turned. And what happens is if you bring your children or grandchildren to church long enough, one day it'll be automatic for them to bring you to church when you can't get yourself to church. We serve a, a generational God. We serve a, a God that establishes his covenant, not just for you, not just for your grandmother, but for the generations that are coming after you. And what I love about the demographic makeup of this church, it's not just, it's incredible ethnic diversity, which rarely exists on Sunday mornings in this country. What I, what I love about this church is also the generational diversity that exists, where you have grandmothers, mothers, and daughters all worshiping together, trying to follow along with the, the fast song as quickly as possible and not have a epileptic seizure moment with all the lights at all of our locations, but we serve a generational God where we can sing a new song that you've never heard of before and I exalt thee at the same time. It's a beautiful thing. I don't want a young church because we'd be full of energy with no depth and I don't want an old church because we'd be full of depth with no energy. <laughs> if I just have a young church we'd have no money. <laughs> if I just had an old church, I'd have all the money, but no, no people to reach. And so I'm so grateful for a generational church. And Genesis 17 establishes this covenant generationally with Abram. It says this, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Oh, I'm so grateful for an everlasting covenant. It's not temporary. It's not merit-based. It's not situational. It's not circumstantial. It's everlasting. To God, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. We serve a generational God who established his covenant long ago. And it continues to establish that covenant to be our God and for us to be his people. Let's pray. Father, we love your word. Help us today. We need you. You're a good God, mighty to save. Your presence is among us, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I uh, have the privilege of being a basketball dad. This is my basketball dad era, okay? This is the AAU era. I'm an Uber driver and a basketball dad. And something happens to me when I go to these games. I forget that I'm saved by grace. <laughs> I forget that I said the sinner's prayer. Something happens to me. I don't know what, I go back to my heathen days. Vocabulary changes. My view on the ref's eternal destination <laughs> completely transforms. We were in Butner, the great metropolis of Butner yesterday at a wild AAU tournament, three courts back to back sharing the same baseline. It was crazy. Cops were there. It was nuts. They weren't there for me, okay? <laughs> and I realized that I'm the best basketball player from the sidelines. It's amazing how good I am on the sidelines. It's my court vision is unbelievable when I'm on the sidelines. My basketball IQ of knowing when you should shoot and when you should not shoot and when you should cut and when you should drive, it's my coaching ability as a parent is so good. 
I realize that I'm better on the sidelines than I am on the court. You know, I'm the best basketball player when I'm not playing. Isn't that interesting? You know, when I was the best parent, before I had kids, I'd walk through Target, see some kid misbehaving, and be like, well, if I was their daddy, I'd spank them right now, aisle 12, clean up on aisle 12. <laughs> Remember that before you were a kid? You lived in this reality that doesn't exist? I remember when I was, I, was the best, I was the best parent before I had kids. Remember when you said, I'll never give my kid an iPad these just generation, never. My kid's never going to lay eyes on a screen if their eyes touch a screen. Oh, my goodness. And the day they're born, you're like, here's two iPads, a battery pack, and a Verizon plan so that you never lose signal. We tend to be the best version of ourselves when we really don't have the responsibility, you right? And what's interesting is when it comes to parenting, as parents, we're often experts in what is wrong with our children and amateurs at what is wrong with ourselves. Ain't nobody want to hear this today. We, I was trying to convince my son, I was projecting my lack of athleticism onto my child because I'm a professional in seeing what he should do and an amateur in seeing what I should do. And I wonder if parenting is more about me becoming better than my children becoming better. I wonder if it's more about my development than their development. I don't know. I, I just had that thought. And last week we, we kicked off this series, Kids Without Lids. And we just have a foundational three points that we want to make sure all of our kids do. We want to make sure that we raise kids who love God, kids who love their family, and kids who love the church. That's why I love this church, because I believe we're raising, helping you. We can't raise them, but we're partnering with you to raise kids who love God, kids who love their family, and kids who love the church. And we do not get a glimpse into Jesus's pubescent years. Our primary example for living is Jesus Christ. And we don't get a glimpse into his pubescent years from ages 12 to 29. We have no record of his direct experiences. We only have one verse. It's almost as if God was like, good luck. Because I'm not going to share with you what Jesus did from 12 to 29. You're going to have to figure it out on your own. And, and, and this is what we have in Luke 2.52. It says this, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And then silent. From 12 to 29. This is what we're left with. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and in favor with with man. Nothing is written in the Gospels of Jesus' next 18 years. <laughs> what happened? How did he do it? Joseph and Mary didn't write a book. We have no record of what happened between age 12 and 29. All we know is that four things took place he grew in wisdom. He grew in stature, he grew in favor with God, and he grew in favor with man. So what are the four things that we have to model during our children's pubescent years? We have to make sure they grow in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with man. Now, I'm smack dab in the middle of this season. I have kids right in the middle of this period. I have a 16-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 13-year-old. Please pray for me in tongues. And if you don't pray in tongues, just make it up. Please put a stick of butter over my doorpost because I need all the help I can get. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to raise our kids in these four areas. Number one is wisdom. Wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is teaching children to become discerning and decisive. They need to know what is right they need to know what is wrong. Your job as a parent is to teach children wisdom. We are going to raise kids 
who are led by the spirit and think rationally. Okay. One more time. Led by the spirit. God, what are you saying? And think rationally. I shouldn't touch the stove. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't go there. Morality is knowing what is right and wrong. And we can't raise kids who live in moral poverty. They can't grow up not knowing what is right and what is wrong. And it's our job to give them moral riches, to increase their net worth as it pertains to morality. And one of the best ways for them to grow in wisdom is for them to learn to use these three words, please, sorry, thanks. Please, sorry, thanks. You wanna know a wise child? They use please, they use sorry, they use thanks. Please, sorry, thanks. We're gonna get into some really practical teaching today, but that's the first thing is please, sorry, thanks. There's actually a book by Mark Batterson who wrote the Circle uh, Maker book. It's called Please, Sorry, Thanks. And he talks about how if you can use these three words, you will always be wise. Here are character traits to teach your children. Number one, you have to teach them to be honest. I can't protect a liar. You have to tell the truth. Even if you messed up, you got to tell the truth. All right. I, I, you, have to, you have to convince your children that you are the safest place for the truth in their life. Because if they're lying to you, you can't help them. I can't get you a lawyer if you're lying. Now, you, if you said, I messed up, I did something I should not have done, I am in trouble, I can come to your rescue as your parent. But if you're lying to me, it erodes trust. And if I can't trust you, it's harder for me to protect you. I'm going to do everything I can. But if you can teach your kid that the number one thing they cannot do in, as, as it pertains to talking with you is to lie, then everything else, the relationship will be built on honesty, which is a relationship on trust. And if you lose trust, you lose everything. So the one thing I'm teaching my kid is even if you mess up or even if you, even if you shouldn't have done something that you did, I need you to tell me. And I'm going to respond accordingly in, in protection and safeguarding, not to avoid consequences or skirt the law. But what I'm going to do is if you're honest with me, I guarantee I can protect you. I'll do everything in my power. You got to teach your kids to be honest. The next thing you have to do is teach your kids to be courageous. In the, uh, the bubble wrap generation of our world, we have to teach our kids to, you know, hey, we're going to put some dirt on it. Get back out there. Walk it off. It's all right. We took the training wheels off. We're not putting them back on. Yeah. You're going to go down that hill. Yeah. I did not walk up all of these steps at this water slide to take the walk of shame with this tube. We're taking this tube down the slide. No. Yes, we are. Come on now. You got to teach them to be courageous. You got to teach them to stand in front of their peers. It, don't do their presentation for them. They got to build that volcano themselves. They got to do that science project themselves. You got to teach them to be honest. You got to teach them to be courageous. Next thing you got to teach them is to be generous. Teach them that everything that they own belongs to God anyways. Everything they have is God's. If you teach them that everything belongs to God, it will be so much easier for them to relinquish things in their later years. And then lastly, teach them to be compassionate. Teach them to be compassionate. Let, let's teach them to have a heart for people who might be less fortunate. Let's teach people to, let's, let's teach them to look at the situation from the lens of someone who cares deeply. So we're gonna teach them to be honest, courageous, generous, and compassionate. If you teach them those things, they will become wise. Proverbs 13, one says, a wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a mocker does not respond to rebukes. So how do you make a wise son? Well, you have to have fatherly instruction. Wisdom is not an accident. You don't wake up more wise. Your default is to foolery. Our default is to sin. Our default is to wrongdoing. But if 
a father instructs their son, then they can become wise. So fatherly instruction is what produces a wise son. Well, my, just, my kid isn't very smart. Father, it's time to put down the remote and pick up a book. Because it says a wise son heeds his father's instruction, meaning the father is doing the instructing. All right, number two, stature. This is physical development. Hold on to your hats, folks. Stature involves a developing body and disciplined eyes. In the years, 12 to 29, mucho changeo. A lot. The fastest growth in a human body happens during puberty. So there's chemicals, there's emotions, there's changes, and you as a parent are the chief navigator of stature, of the physical development of your children. And in this season of a young person's life, stuff starts to happen that you, I mean, you, I wasn't ready. The frog on the sidewalk that's dead, it used to not cause tears. And now, we gotta save the frog. Why do we have to, we didn't have to save the frog last year. We didn't have to save the frog when you were nine. Why do we have to save the frog when you were 13? Because what's happening, there's, there's new chemicals infusing into their body. There's new changes. There's rapid rates of change and there, emotional turmoil. So one of the things that you have to make sure that you get ahead of is how they discipline their eyes and they prepare for a developing body. It says in Proverbs 5, 15 and 16, to drink water from your own well, share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets having sex with just anyone? During the 12 to 29 years, you need to have a Proverbs 5, 15 through 16 conversation that says, we're not at this house, we're not opening our well for just anyone. Our well is reserved for our spouse. And if you spill water into the streets, you're not building uh, on a foundation that is going to establish the family values and the biblical values by which we're trying to live. Now, many of you would say, well, I've already messed up my child. They just do whatever they want. From this day forward, the well is closed. Like, this is not a, a church that is going to shame you for your past. But under this teaching... This is a from a this day forward. I'm not going to let my children go explore. I'm not going to let them try it before you buy it. You know, well, it's like I hear it all the time. It's like, well, wouldn't you test drive a car? You know, we're going to live together before we get married. Wouldn't you test drive a car before you? Yeah, a car. <laughs> Without a soul. I don't have soul ties with a car. I'm not creating generational damage with a car. The car can't impregnate me. I can't have a child with this car. I can't have emotional damage from this car. Of course I'm gonna test drive a car, but I am closing my children's well until the day that they get married. Ain't nobody wanna hear this sermon today. A lot is changing. They're finding the the opposite sex attractive. Their, their, their body is changing. The way they think is changing. The way they, they talk is changing. And you have to be prepared to teach them through these very challenging times. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Before you're cute, you're a temple. Before you're strong, you're a temple. Whom you have from God, look at this, you are not your own. My body, my choice. No. If you're in Christ, you don't get to decide. You don't get, I'm not just talking about uh, uh, terminating pregnancies. I'm talking about everything you do with your body is no longer your own. It's a daily sacrifice. It's, uh, you have to have disciplined eyes. I'm preaching old school today, but I'm going to let them have it. 
I was scheduled to be at another church and they canceled me because they didn't like comment I made about the debate the other night. So he called me yesterday and said, he said, we, we've gone a different direction. You already bought my plane ticket though. So different. Anyways, you are not your own. I'll call the shots. I'll take the shots. I'll, I'll do both. You, you are not your own for you were bought with a price. So what glorify God in your body? My body is meant to bring glory to God. But I got to have disciplined eyes. I got to teach my son disciplined eyes. Keep your blinders on. Keep the well closed. We're not spilling this in the streets. And if anyone wants you to spill it in the streets, they don't belong in your circle. So you need to have temple talk where you talk about the, the body and what's changing. It's your job. It's a, as a parent, we're going to do everything we can to resource you and to partner with you, but it's your job. I, I can't do all of you. I can only do what I can do. So you need to talk about hormonal changes and why there's emotional breakdowns and personal hygiene. Come on, middle schoolers, let's go. <laughs> Never seen so much Axe body spray in my life. Pray for the leaders going to camp, man. You need to talk about menstruation and acne and hormonal changes and chemical imbalances and thoughts and sleep and sleep deprivation and uh, dopamine and, and consumption of, of, of evil thoughts. Like all of that's your job. If you don't teach them, the locker room will. So let me help you. There's a book called The Talk. It's here to help you. It's seven lessons to introduce your child to biblical sexuality. It's like a really small book. Now, I would encourage any parent that's picking this up, um, please peruse it before you sit there in front of your six-year-old because there are photos, okay? So you need to uh, look at it. You know, don't go into this blind, okay? But I, I think the age is getting younger and younger as to when we should... Uh, teach our children. So if you have like an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old, you should probably pick this up. If you have a 13-year-old that you haven't spoken to already, you need to pick this up. And if you need financial assistance to get this $8 book, I will pay for anyone who needs this book, financial assistance, or I'll give you my copy because my kids have all, we've all gone through it now. So I'll do my very best to resource you as much as I possibly can. This is a very helpful practical way, biblical way to teach our children. Don't let YouTube University educate your, your kid. Don't let TikTok, there's a reason why they're going to ban, don't let it be the thing that teaches them. And then secondly, the second resource is called Passport to Purity. This is a getaway. It's a retreat that fathers take with sons and mothers take with daughters. And it's several lessons there's these things called CDs. There's like, um, it's audio. I had to go to Goodwill to buy a CD player. Not, not lying. I, didn't ha I don't even have a CD player. So I, and it, what's great is, is that there's uh, examples and illustrations and like exercises and different activities in each lesson. And what's great about it is the audio story goes on like a narrative journey and it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you so that you don't have to you don't have to explain everything. It's like having someone helping you through some of those tough times. Uh, we went on a, my son and I went on a retreat, went to a baseball game two night, you know, at a, at a Airbnb. And we just spent some time discussing the things that matter most. We, we only get them for a certain number of time. And so it's important that you teach, teach your children. And uh, you need to teach them that their body is a temple. There's a word that's not used very often, but as of the time of this recording, it is the summertime. And uh, you might be getting this on your YouTube algorithm in the wintertime, but as of right now, it's the summertime. And I would encourage you to teach what's called modesty. I know it's foreign. You're like, oh, what is that? It's an alien in the sky. But in order to cultivate disciplined eyes, we also need to train up all children to be modest in what they decide to wear. It's 
swimwear matters. It matters. You might say, well, just teach your son not to stare. Well, teach your kid to put on a sweatshirt. It's like, it's both. It's both. It's both. Don't be sending your student to camp with those shorts. I don't, nobody wants to see that. All right. Uh, it's so important. I know that this seems so old school and so traditional, but we're not supposed to be like the world. I'm not saying you need to churn your own butter and wear a skirt down to your ankles. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Please don't misinterpret what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is at that critical age and stage, you should give no one a chance to take advantage with their mind what could have been saved for marriage by simply have bought a larger size or told them you can only wear that around the house. You cannot wear that out in public. I've been to Walmart. It used to be like you go to Walmart at a certain time and it gets crazy. It's 24 seven now. You need to teach your kids. That's not appropriate. You can be fashionable. You can be fashionable and modest. It's possible. It is possible. Okay. Thirdly, favor with God. Spiritual development. So we have wisdom, stature, favor with God. Favor with God involves discovering their inheritance and being devoted. Favor with God involves discovering inheritance and being devoted. I want my kids to not be afraid of God. I want them to know they have the favor of God on their life. I don't want my kids living. I want them to fear the Lord, but I don't want them living afraid of God. There's a huge difference. I don't want my kids waking up every day and being like, oh, I thought, you ever had that like almost throw up cry? Like, I, thought, I, I thought about a cuss word. I'm going to hell forever. I want them to know that they have the inheritance of God. They've been chosen by God, destined for greatness. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's got great plans for them. Uh, if they walk in fear of lightning from God, then they will never walk in favor of the blessing of God. So I've got to walk in the favor of God. I've got to remind them that they are sons and daughters of God. I've got to remind them that God's been good to them. I've got to remind them that God has an inheritance that he's already established for them. You know what's great about an inheritance? Is you get it without working for it. Woo! I'm grateful to be a son of God. I'm grateful my children. It, I... I I met a guy who won the lottery. This isn't me advocating for playing the lottery, okay? Everyone twists the words on the internet. So I'm not advocating for the lottery unless you help us pay for our new building out front. <laughs> Somehow there's like a, a tax loophole somewhere around the... I don't know how it works, but... I'm just kidding. I don't advocate playing the lottery unless you win. That's the only thing. I met a guy who, who won the lottery. And it's fascinating. And um, we got into talking about it. And he says he is going to make $1,000 every day for the rest of his life. It's $1,000 a day for the rest of his life. That's unbelievable, by the way. How, how different would you live? <laughs> if every day it was just $1,000. Now, some of you are so spiritual, be like, I give it all to missions. I would just be a kingdom builder. No one would have to know. I wouldn't have to donate a pew. I wouldn't need my, my name on a plaque or on a building. Come on now. What's amazing is that in Christ, his mercies are new every morning. Therefore, we wake up every day with the favor of God on our lives. We don't have to live with our heads down and our hearts heavy. We can look and say, we won the lottery by being adopted into the family of God. And we are now sons and daughters of righteousness. I gotta teach my kids about the favor of God. 
It says in Proverbs 13, 22, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. I hope my dad hears that verse. <laughs> you watching, dad? A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. I don't want our kids to live with an, I don't want them to live without an, aware, an awareness of their inheritance. I want them to look at God as their provider. I want them to look at God as, a, as the one who loves them, who, who, who sent his son to die for them. I think a lot of times we instill fear into our children, but it's not the fear of God, it's the fear of what God might do. And that's not good parenting. Whenever God blesses our family, I, I, I bring the kids together and I say, you see this? This is the goodness of God. You see, that this is the greatness of God. I want them to hear me thanking God every single day. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. I want my kids waking up every day saying, there's something that just hit my bank account. And it's the goodness of God. It's the favor of God. All right. Lastly, favor with man. This is relational development. This is interpersonal skills. This is with, with the dopamine addiction we have to this thing, it's actually diminished relational development to where we have to teach our kids now things that were probably common for most of us growing up. But favor with man comes by way of being dependable and distinguished. Distinguished meaning just a cut above right? You want, to, you want to raise kids that are dependable. You want when your kid walks into the room for them to say, I can count on him. Yeah. I can count on her. Yeah. They don't have to be the smartest. They don't have to be the fastest, but they need to be the most dependable. So they need to be the most dependable. So here are some habits that help you establish favor with men. Are you ready? This is some, some teaching today. They make confident eye contact. This is important. <laughs> People don't want to hear this today. They can't just look away or look down. They need to make confident eye contact. When you meet someone, you make eye contact with them. Nice to meet you. My name is Mike. Nice to meet you. Go to the next one. They use full sentences. And you think I'm joking. I had to put this on the screen. That's how, that's how, like, i worried I am. Like, you want something to eat? Uh. How was school? Uh. What's that friend's name? Uh. Excuse me? You have to teach your children to communicate. They need to use full sentences. Full sentences. They use full sentences. All right, number, number three. They do not quit mid-season or semester. <laughs> All right. They don't have to, I'm speaking of college, they don't have to graduate, but they can't quit halfway through a semester. They don't have to be the star athlete, but they're not allowed to quit halfway through a season. You have to teach them before they commit to something, how long the commitment is, what is in what is it, what does it entail? And we are going to go every practice, every game, whether you're riding the bench or you're the star, we're, we're finishing what we started. So this is important. I, we went to basketball yesterday. We got whooped. I knew it within the first five minutes. I could tell before. I could just tell by the uniforms. <laughs> Come on, you parents know that. You walk in like, oh, yeah. I was like, these uniforms are nice. These kids have played here before. <laughs> and there were two games. First game, blown out. I mean, we lost bad. So I went up to Joel. <laughs> this is terrible. I was pretty frustrated. I said, you want to go home? 
Because I don't want to sit for another, it's an hour and a half in Butner, right? There's nothing else to do. There's no golf course close by. I don't want to sit in this hot gym with a thousand other people for an hour and a half waiting. And then sure enough, he said, no, I want to stay. I was like, well, we're going to stay. Second game. I mean, these kids are, I mean, literally just making children out of our children. <laughs> they're, they're lobbing. They're lobbing dunks. This is JV. This is not varsity. This kid had a beard. <laughs> and a record. And I said, I said, okay, we'll stay. And I said, we're not quitting until that, that buzzer. I said, well, we're going to play defense the whole game. I told him, I said, you're going to play the whole game. It, 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 until, that, until that clock hits zero, we're playing the whole game. Okay? Crazy thing happened. They lost, but <laughs> a kid walked by the scoreboard and unplugged the, the scoreboard on accident. It was an accident. So they had to reset the clock, but the young man running the clock couldn't remember <laughs> what the time was on the clock. So they added five more minutes cause to the game, which made it even worse. I was hoping that he would have let five minutes go past, but we stayed until the end. Why? Because we finished what we start. And if we, before we signed up, we knew that, guess what we have to do today at three o'clock? To drive up to Butner again. Guess what the result will more than likely be? But we said we would do it. And so we're going to do what we said we were going to do. All right. And then lastly, this is a very practical one. I hope I'm helping someone today. They make their beds daily. Okay. They make their beds daily. All right. Some of you haven't made the journey into your child's room in a long time. You need to get your vaccinations up to speed. You need to get your passport. You need to get a hazmat suit and go up there. Check and see what's happening up there. Because you need to establish, first of all, your, if you're paying the rent or the mortgage, it's your room. So if I need to rip the hinges off the door, I will, because it's my house. You don't get to lock your door in my house. In my house, you can't lock your door. We do not allow our children to lock their door. What could you possibly be doing at 14 that you need your door locked? I'm not here to violate your privacy, but I am here to raise you in the ways of the Lord. So you got to be present. And one of the ways that instills great discipline into children is when they make their beds every single day because it is a trigger habit that actually, it bleeds into other things. So when I go to the 5 a.m. class at the gym that I go to, I eat better for the rest of the day. Why? Because I don't want to ruin what I did in the morning. Same thing for making their bed. You will make children more disciplined when you do that. All right, Proverbs 3 three through four. John, you can return at all of our locations. I'm closing with this. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people. And look at this. And you will earn a good reputation. So you can't earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift given by God through his son, Jesus Christ, who was paid for on the cross. But a good reputation, that's earned. How's that earned? Loyalty and kindness. So you need to stay loyal to the Lord, loyal to the house of God, loyal to the presence of God, and you need to be kind to people. And when you do that, you'll earn a good reputation. So a good reputation can be earned and a good reputation can be lost. And what took you decades to build can be lost in seconds. And I want to raise kids with a good reputation. I want to raise kids who love the Lord, 
who are loyal to his house, who are loyal to the Bible, who are loyal to morality, and who are kind to those around them. So here's what I want to do. If you are ages 12 to 29, which were the, the years that we don't have access to, all we know is that Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with man. If you are years 12 to 29, I want you to stand to your feet right now. At all of our locations, years 12 to 29, stand to your feet. Look at this. Come on, Lord. We might not be, be so bad off after all. I want you to know from your pastor, I used to be your age not too long ago, but I'm getting older. I love you and I'm proud of you. And I believe God's best days for you are not behind you, they're in front of you. At all of our locations, I want you to know that God's got great plans for your life. You are in the best years of your life. The decisions you make right now will carry over for generations to come. So I want to pray. Let's stretch our hands at all of our locations to the young people standing all around. I pray wisdom in Jesus' name. I pray that you would grow in wisdom like Jesus did. I pray that you would be able to discern and decide right from wrong in every, every decision. The school you go to, the job you take, the people you hang out with, the places that you go. I just pray for increased discernment. That, that when you're faced with a, a, a decision, that there would be some sort, of, a, some sort of trigger in your mind that says, what would, what would Jesus do here? What's the wise thing to do right now? Give, Lord, give them the ability to see 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Give them the ability, give them a glimpse into their future when they're up against the decision that would make great impact. Keep them safe, oh God. Protect their minds from bad friends. Protect their minds from bad decisions. Protect their minds from evil thoughts. I cancel suicidal thoughts in Jesus' name. No anxiety, no depression, no need to, to, to please men, no need to, to spill the well in the streets. Be wise. I pray that you would grow in stature. I pray that you would become strong in Jesus' name. That you would have self-control of all of your emotions, even though you don't know what's happening. I pray that you wouldn't be overwhelmed. I pray against any, any genetic disease in Jesus' name. Any hereditary disease in Jesus' name. I break off any curses that come from your father or your mother in Jesus' name. We say you're free from that free from that in Jesus name that you will grow in wisdom you will grow in stature and I declare the favor of God over your life right now I declare no weapon formed against you shall prosper you are more than a conqueror because you are in Christ Jesus the inheritance that awaits for you is new every single morning you are not going to have to wait till you get to heaven for heaven to make its way down to you I pray you would be blessed in your coming and blessed in your going Going, blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Oh, you are blessed and highly favored. I pray that you would be a cut above the rest, that God would pluck you from the miry clay and he would place your feet on solid rock. I pray for favor with men. Pray for favor with your boss. Favor with college admissions offices in Jesus' name. Favor with FAFSA favor with scholarships, favor with coaches and athletic programs, favor with ideas and favor with influence, favor with, with man in Jesus' name. I pray that this church would produce favorable people, favor with God and favor with men. I pray that this church would produce wise children, children of favor. I pray for any child that is not in this room right now, represented across all of our locations, to those that are going through a hard time, those who didn't want to get up this morning, those who are in a season of rebellion, those who might be currently incarcerated or in trouble, I declare the favor of God. Chase them down right now where they are at and may the prodigal children return home. May they come to their senses and come back to the Father's house. 
Lord, we love you. We thank you. We commit these children to you. We dedicate their decisions to the Lord from this day forward. May they no longer live in the shame of their past. Regret, regret has no place to live. Evicted in Jesus' name. Those DMs that you regret, evicted in Jesus' names. Those decisions that you regret, evicted in Jesus' name. That mindset you regret, it's evicted in Jesus' name. For who the sun sets free is free indeed. Your sin is as far as the east is from the west. In Jesus' name, we declare favor and blessing over every family. Amen and amen. Let's clap our hands for the word of God today. You may be seated.